I often feel sorry, as I expect you do, that memory is so short. But there are some memories which stay with us all our lives, because they are far too vivid and personal ever to be forgotten. And so I suppose we've all got some personal memories of the Battle of Britain. Perhaps we live again some incident of great danger, or some moment of personal triumph over tremendous odds. Or we see again the first air battles over London, and a mighty barrage going into action in daylight, or the grotesque sight of a great city burning. Or perhaps it's just a picture of white smoke trails high in the summer sky over Kent. But for my part, I remember a quiet corner of Sussex, with a long line of the downs and the heat haze shimmering. I can picture again our hurricanes standing in the shade of tall elm trees, the spire of Chichester Cathedral and the gleam of sunlight on Chichester Harbour. I remember the sudden release from tension and the comfortable feeling of content and achievement when we flew in low from the sea, the final throwing back of the hood and the long, lazy sweep into land over the downs, the taxiing in across the field, the cutting of the switches, and then the silence and the sudden hot smell of summer. And if the covers of the gun ports had been blown aside and the leading edge of the wings blackened with cordite, then Shorty and Joe, the fitter and rigger, would have noticed it long before you came in over the far hedge, would have come running up, eager to help you down, and by innumerable questions to share in the triumph or disappointment of their own particular kite. But whatever memory I have of those days, a telephone ring er rings urgently and insistently in the background. That was the operations telephone in our dispersal hut, and its note meant more to us than any human voice. It came to us through the open door of the hut, over to where we lay sprawled in our shirt sleeves in May Wests in the shade of the trees. Often, it interrupted a sentence which was never finished, but always it sent us scrambling to our hurricanes. Then there would be a feverish clipping on of parachute harnesses, a maddening struggle with helmet straps, a whirring of self-starters, a few staccato coughs from a protesting engine, and then a shattering roar of twelve Rolls-Royce Merlins bursting into life. And so off, over the roofs of Chichester, twelve hurricanes heading out to sea over Selsey Bill. And when the telephone rang on that summer morning of the 8th of August, it seemed to us no more urgent or insistent than usual. Someone shouted across from the hut, Scramble, patrol convoy south of Selsey Bill. And the girls on the YMCA van under the trees must have thought, there they go again, but they'll be back in a few minutes to finish their donuts and cocoa. It certainly didn't occur to them that in a few minutes, those 12 hurricanes rapidly disappearing out to sea would be facing the onslaught of an aerial armada. And the thought certainly didn't occur to us. Far below, the little ships, the same little ships we patrol so often, crawled on towards the west in two long lines. Some of the ships were flying balloons, and they glistened white in the sunlight. To the north, the Sussex coast stretched from beach ahead, past the old familiar landmarks of Selsey Bill, the Solent, and the Isle of Wight, away to Portland Bill in the west. And in the south, towards France, great banks of white cumulus clouds tied up to prodigious heights. And out of the south they came heralded by a sudden sharp warning over the radio, very many bandits approaching you from the south. I suppose we all had different thoughts, but I remember thinking, as the cloud of little black dots grew steadily nearer, this is it. This is what you've been waiting for. Being struck with a strange feeling of unreality and detachment that never left me through the days that followed. I thought of my own home, only five minutes flying away across the downs, I picture them sitting down to breakfast, my father reading his paper, and my sister pouring out the coffee, and the sunlight streaming in through the big French windows. It seemed so much a part of my life, a part of so many lives, and couldn't be given up. We worked round into the sun, climbing hard, and soon the first wave of dive bombers passed below us. We went into the attack together, each picking his own target. Out of a corner of my eye, a balloon burst suddenly into flame and went down, a vivid red gash against the sea. I remember watching my own particular hun growing in the sights, larger and larger, the black crosses, the details of the paintwork, and then the pilot's head. I remember wondering whether he was looking at the little ships, hoping he wouldn't look round. And finally, the pressure on the gun button, the shattering vibration, and then somebody's voice very urgently over the radio, look out, 109s, and then the dogfight. It only lasted a few minutes, but it seemed like ours. There were glimpses of aircraft flicking past, some British and some German. A billow of white as a parachute opened out, a flash of flame as a Hun went down in flames. And always in front, 
one's own particular Han, diving, twisting, zooming, rolling onto its back till the final dive, the final squirt and the feverish prayer that the old hurricane would pull out in time and stop that horrible, fascinating rushing up of the sea. One of the most vivid memories I have is that diving and pull out, holding on as long as you could to get the chap and wondering if you left it too late and the awful moment when you pull out and aren't sure if you're going to make it. That was the start of the day, perhaps modest in comparison with the many battles that followed during the weeks of August and September, but it was the fight I personally remember most vividly because it came so suddenly out of those peaceful surroundings. During the weeks that followed, when the fighting rose to the crescendo of the September battles, there was little time to think except about the minute-to-minute -minute job in hand. For the ground crews, that meant the night and day work of servicing and patching up performance of what we thought were miracles. And for the pilots, an endless succession of dogfights, day after day, daily more frequent and hectic. One dogfight is really very much like another. One moment the fight is on, and the next the sky is suddenly very empty, and you are left wondering if you haven't been making rather a fuss about nothing. It's only long afterwards, you know, get, get things into their proper perspective, that you realize that perhaps there was something in it after all. You heard the group captain say he flew hurricanes. Well, all the time he was fighting, I was working day and night, repairing the ones that were damaged. They came in in all sorts of conditions. They were all major repairs, which means a complete overhaul of the whole machine. Every part surveyed and replaced or repaired as required. Pretty well rebuilt. The damage we were repairing was usually caused by forced landings of the fighters a belly landed by a wounded pilot or landing with the undercarriage up, perhaps on a cornfield, perhaps on a moor at well over a hundred miles an hour. Well, some months prior to the Battle of Britain, we began these repairs of hurricanes and spitfires that had been damaged in flight and in operations and things were all very slow. The men were new to it. But under the guidance of key foremen with long experience, they soon came along very well. And keyed up with the idea that they were doing a really important job, every man put absolutely his best into it. Eventually we arrived at the stage of the Battle of Britain when the urgency was felt by everybody. And we began very long hours. From eight in the morning till 10 at night, 14 hours every day, plus the blackout. Now, don't forget the blackout, not just from sunset to sunrise, but all day long as well, through that sweltering hot summer of 1940. Artificial light and none too good ventilation all round the clock. If the Royal Air Force spent its blood, we had the toil and the sweat, bags of it. In fact, the long, hard slog became such a sameness that nobody seemed to be sure what day it was, except when it came to Friday. They knew that, all right. It was payday. There, under the glaring arc lamps, were the spitfires and the hurricanes being repaired at the same time. And in the particular place where I was, the flight shed, one side was occupied by the spitfires and the other by hurricanes, rather like a hospital for aeroplanes. It was a very healthy rivalry between the two sides, and a fair amount of chipping went on. The spitfire repairers called the hurricanes rag dolls and we, in turn, called the Spitfires Salmon Tins. Eventually, we got to the stage where we were turning out one rag doll a day, and they reached almost one salmon tin a day. To get a hurricane a day or a Spitfire a day repaired was good going. It was only made possible by the keenness of the men, and each team had its own job to do. We worked in teams of four or five, and each team tackled each job as it came along to them with absolute keenness. I remember one hurricane in particular which was very badly damaged. It was in such a state that it caused us some head scratching, and we wondered whether we should repair it or scrap it. However, our enthusiasm to put another aircraft back into service won the toss, and the job was put in hand. As the work progressed, we were confident that the decision to repair it had been right, and finally the aircraft was ready for test flight. When the pilot taxied back onto the tarmac, we were a little surprised, but my heavens, weren't we proud, 
when the pilot yelled out, a good one, which meant that this hurricane, L1917, had passed out ready for service on its first test flight. So that heap of scrap went back to the Battle of Britain. It was just before the battle we saw our first hurricane fly, and later we saw our second hurricane fly from our own airfield. It was piloted by a pilot who later took part in the Battle of Britain. And when that happened, and we found out what he'd been doing with an aircraft that we had repaired, we felt definitely that we were taking part in the battle. While the men were working these long hours, the fact that we were working in blackout conditions, in artificial light, took its toll, and people were beginning to get very tired. But despite this, there wasn't the slightest slackening off anywhere, until the time came when it was felt we were making a good pace, and we could now have a slight respite. We then, for a period, had one day off in eight. Well, what was it that made us go flat out? I think it was just that each person was an inspiration to his partner, a team spirit, similar to that in the RAF itself. It frequently happened that when we were leaving the works at night, we could see the shell fire from the guns over London. And if we needed anything to remind us of the job we had in hand, that certainly gave it to us. 